Thank you. That concludes general questions. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. Before we move to First Minister's questions, I invite the First Minister to make some brief remarks to mark Remembrance Day. President Officer, on Sunday, Scotland pays tribute to the brave men and women who laid down their lives to protect our country and the freedoms that we all enjoy. Their bravery and their sacrifice make possible the peace and the liberty that we all so rightly cherish today. We remember them in our hearts and we commit ourselves to work for the peaceful and democratic way of life for which they made the ultimate sacrifice. Thank you. I now call on Russell Finlay. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, this week we solemnly remember all of those who made the ultimate sacrifice on behalf of our country and in protection of our values. Those who fought in the First World War are no longer with us and those who witnessed the horrors of the Second World War become ever fewer. As conflict continues to claim innocent lives around the world, I and my party pay tribute to Britain's armed forces for keeping us safe. For all of the fallen and for all of those who continue to serve, we will remember them. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Anna Sarwar. Presiding officer, this weekend we will mark Remembrance Sunday, the day when we remember all those who have made the ultimate sacrifice to protect our country and to face down tyranny. It is also a day when we recommit to the cause of peace across the world, a cause that has never been more important. And as we prepare for Remembrance Sunday, we must come together to remember the lives we have lost and commit to supporting our current serving men and women. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. Thank you. I now call Lorna Slater. Thank you to the presiding officer for giving us this time today to remember and be grateful. I grew up in a time of peace and plenty. I have never known war. And I am so grateful to the people and democratic institutions who have made this possible. We said never again after the wars of the early 21st, 20th century, and yet violent conflict once again tears our world apart, destroying homes, lives, communities, and futures. War crimes and genocide have not been banished to the past. They are being committed today as the world looks on and is complicit. I fear for the future as existing conflicts escalate and democratic ideals retreat, will future children be able to grow up in peace and plenty? We take this moment to acknowledge everyone who has suffered and is suffering because of war, and to remember our responsibilities in creating and nurturing peace. Thank you. And I now call Alice Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, every year, as they plough their fields, the farmers of Arras and Thiepval and Passchendaele unearth bullets and shrapnel and other material of war. It's called the Iron Harvest, and it serves more than a century later as a reminder of the supreme sacrifice made by so many for the freedoms that we all enjoy today. But I'm struck, Presiding Officer, that right now, that same material of war is being buried in the soils of Ukraine, as the fighting men and women of the armed forces of Ukraine fight as a fire break, break to protect the freedoms of the democracies that we all enjoy. So this Remembrance Sunday and every Remembrance Sunday, we will choose to remember those who have fallen in supreme service of this country and those who are falling still to protect the freedoms we all enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. We will move to First Minister's questions, and at question number one, I call Russell Finlay. Thank you, President Officer. One of Scotland's most successful businessmen, Sir Tom Hunter, responded to Labour's tax rises last week by saying, there's no economy in the world that has ever taxed its way to economic growth. So does John Swinney know of any examples? First Minister. What I know is that we have to be prepared to invest in economic growth and I have set out my firm view that investing in economic growth means investing in the infrastructure and the capacity of our country 
and investing in the public services upon which a great deal of economic foundations are founded. I also understand the importance of creating and encouraging and stimulating private economic activity in our economy, which is why one of the four priorities of my government is the supporting and nurturing of economic growth. Russell Finlay. Thank you. Uh, John Swinney surely knows that high tax kills growth and costs jobs. But in his topsy-turvy world, hitting hard-working Scots with high taxes will somehow boost our struggling economy. Even his own MSPs are worried. Today, an SNP-led Finance Committee report says they are deeply concerned about the Scottish Government's approach. In their report, Professor David Heald of Glasgow University called elements of Scotland's income tax rates as ludicrous, also quoted our Aberdeen and Grampian Chamber of Commerce. The tax burden on businesses is extremely high. This penalises success and reduces profitability. So does John Swinney accept that their concerns are valid? First Minister. I think anyone that looks at my track record knows that I engage closely with the business community on all of these questions. And I understand also there's a vibrant debate about economic choices to be made. And uh, I suspect Russell Finlay from his questioning is on one side of that argument and I'm on the other. Uh, because I believe in investment to stimulate growth. Because we've had an example over the last 14 years of what um, the constraining of investment does. It reduces life chances, it reduces opportunity, it reduces growth. It's been an unmitigated disaster for the country, and that's the record of the Conservative Party. Russell Finlay. John Swinney talks about investment stimulating growth, but the point is there has been no return on this so-called investment by this government. The, the independent Fraser Valander Institute found that only 9% of firms in Scotland uh, under, say that the SNP government understands the business environment. Yeah. And over the last three years, SNP ministers received over £600 million from the UK government to provide rates relief for retail, hospitality and leisure sector. But struggling Scottish businesses have barely received one-tenth of this figure. Uh, Michael Bergson of Bucks Bar Group told us that the SNP's failure to pass on rates relief was a disgrace. Yeah. And Stephen Montgomery of the Scottish Hospitality Group says that at the very minimum, tax relief should be passed on in full and with no cap. Scottish businesses urgently need more help. So will John Swinney do the right thing? First Minister. President, so there's a couple of points I'd make at the outset of responding to, to Mr Finlay's latest question to me. The first is that he says there's no evidence of growth. So Scotland's uh, GDP per capita has grown faster than the United Kingdom's since 2007. Accounting for population growth since 2007, GDP per person has grown by 10.5% in Scotland compared to 6.3% at a UK level. Yeah. Yeah. Now that, just to remind Parliament, yeah. so that Parliament has got complete information, yeah. 2007 was the moment that this government was elected. Yeah. So in the lifespan of this government, we've delivered more growth per head than in the rest of the United Kingdom. <laughs> uh, um, the second point, because we're on... We're on, we're on helpful clarifications here, Presiding Officer, if, if, if you may forgive me. It, most of the taxation that is imposed upon business is not determined by this Parliament. Yeah. Most of it is determined by the United Kingdom Parliament. Yeah. And on business rates, we have, of course, the most um, comprehensive small business scheme yeah. of business relief, which for the hospitality sector means, in our estimations, about 50% of the hospitality sector pays absolutely no business rates whatsoever in Scotland. That's where we take our action to support the sector in Scotland. Yeah. Russell Finlay. I, I apologise for standing up too soon. I actually thought he'd finished, uh, but he was still going. Um, 
So when, when faced with uh, the, the reality of what businesses are saying, John Swinney reaches for his big book of selective statistics, yeah. and everyone is pleading for the SNP to change direction. No, Business right. owners, hospitality groups, chambers of commerce, academics, the Scottish Parliament, Finance Committee, even SNP backbenchers. Scotland's tax system needs to change. Higher taxes are stopping businesses from growing, preventing them from creating jobs, which would generate more money for public services. Scotland's businesses need more than rates relief. They need a game-changing tax cut. So in this year's budget, will John Swinney start to repair some of the damage inflicted by the SNP? First Minister. I've already put on the record the fact that this government has delivered more growth per head in Scotland than the United Kingdom has done. And then also in relation to the tax changes that this government has presided over, people like Mr Finlay told us that there would be an exodus of people from Scotland yeah. because of the tax situation. Of course, what we've seen is a net in-migration yeah. to Scotland yeah. over the period well, of, that, uh, of those tax changes being in place. Now, of course, there is a budget to be gone through. And the budget cannot pass this Parliament without agreement of uh, other members beyond the Government Party. We don't command a majority in Parliament. So there are discussions underway, led by the Finance Secretary, which are to construct agreement in the Parliament about what the budget looks like. But the implications of Mr Finlay's point to me is that if we are to, uh, to cut taxes, we will have to cut public expenditure as well. Now, if people are going to come forward with substantive propositions in the dialogue with the Finance Secretary, at least have the democratic responsibility to set out where the tax cuts are going to come, but where the spending cuts are going to come as well. Because if we dabble with the financial madness of the Conservative Party as we got under Liz Truss, we all know where that ends up. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. President Officer, statistics obtained by Scottish Labour show that almost 9,000 Scots waited over 24 hours in a &E up to the end of September this year. That's a full day waiting for treatment. And that is more than the entire number that waited a full day in 2023. And unbelievably, almost 200 Scots waited over two days in a &E. But this is just a snapshot of the crisis in our NHS. Week after week, I come to this chamber and expose how the SNP is failing staff and patients in our NHS. And week after week, John Swinney plays it down and tries to explain away the deadly crisis on his watch. So will he finally admit that the SNP can't be trusted with our NHS and that we need a new direction? First Minister. No. We don't need a new direction. We need to sustain the investment yes. that this government has been making in yeah. the National Health Service yeah. for the last 17 years. And this government has gone beyond the investment that has been undertaken yeah. on a comparative basis by the Barnett Consequentials from the yeah. UK government, because this government has been prepared to invest in the National Health Service in excess of the Barnett consequences on health, because we have taken the tough decisions yeah. to yeah. do so. Yeah. So, Mr Sarwar, is, um, uh, I acknowledge that there are challenges in the National Health Service. I do that on every occasion that members come forward with their points. And I apologise for any individual who waits longer than they should do. But what the government is focused on is making sure that we deliver an effective health service that meets the needs of people in Scotland, and that's the direction that we will follow. Yeah. Yeah. Anna Sarwar. Presiding officer, week after week, John Swinney comes to this parliament and apologises for the performance of his government, and he says there's no need for a new direction. Because the reality is that John Swinney and the SNP have no meaningful plan, no strategy, and no ideas to save our NHS. And the situation's actually got worse since he became First Minister. By September, more people have waited 24 hours in A&E than the entirety of last year. So Scots can't continue to pay the price of SNP incompetence. We do need a change of direction. And as part of Labour's transformative budget, the Scottish Government will receive an additional £789 million for our NHS this year and an additional £1.72 billion for our NHS next year. 
But this vital new money can't be wasted by continued SNP financial mismanagement and SNP incompetence. Put simply, more of the same won't cut it. So will John Swinney commit to using this money to tackle long waits and to reform our NHS so that it's fit for the future? First Minister. Sir, so in the last 12 months, uh, there has been an increase in the number of operations performed in the National Health Service. In the last 12 months to June 2024, outpatient activity has increased over the previous 12 months. There have been increased, um, there have been more than one and a half million attendances at A&E, and there's been an 82% increase in A&E consultant headcount compared to 10 years ago under this government's watch. So, what I would say to Mr. Sarwar is that we are investing, and, but we are fully aware of the challenges that have been faced, and we are addressing them. Now, Mr. Sarwar goes on to talk about the budget, mm -hmm. and he knows from what I said last week that I welcome the investment that has been made in public expenditure as a consequence of the budget, and I give him the absolute assurance that that will be invested in strengthening and reforming and improving the National Health Service. But there is one challenge in all of that. Yes. That budget will only be able to be deployed yeah. if there's a parliamentary majority yeah. in favour of supporting that budget. Yeah. Yeah. So Mr Sarwar is not an innocent bystander Indeed. on that question. Yeah. If, Mr. Sa if Mr Sarwar if Mr Sarwar wants the money to be spent, yeah. he should vote for the budget. Absolutely. Yeah. Sarwar. New money is one thing. What you do with that money to change the direction of our country is another. And there's actually 50,000 fewer planned operations compared to pre-pandemic levels. Scottish Labour has a plan to fix the NHS and make it fit for the future by cutting bureaucracy, investing in new technology, prioritising wraparound community care and creating dedicated teams to clear the backlogs. But all we have from this SNP government is continued denial and a hunt for excuses. On John Swinney's watch, one in six Scots stuck on an NHS waiting list. Yeah. Delayed discharge sky high. Cancer treatment standards missed again and again. Families forced to take out loans or remortgage their homes to go private and NHS staff feeling burnt out and let down. This is the deadly legacy of the SNP's incompetence. They have the money, they have the powers and they've now run out of excuses. So will John Swinney tell the people of Scotland when they will finally have an NHS that is there when they need it, or do we need to wait for a change of government in 2026 for us to get our NHS back? First Minister. All about you. Well, it, I, I don't think Mr Sarwar listened to my second answer, because my answer was quite clear. I set out the, the strengthened measures that we've taken to expand the capacity of the National Health Service. Let's hear the First I, Minister. I acknowledge the challenges that we face in the National Health Service, and I welcome the fact that we have the opportunity for further investment arising out of the United Kingdom budget. I don't know why Mr Sarwar can't just embrace my positive and constructive contribution yeah, yeah, yeah. to the discussion. So, if Mr Sarwar wants to have an engaged conversation about how we can deliver investment to the National Health Service, I suggest he takes seriously the offer from the government to engage around the budget process. Because I come back to my fundamental point. It's all very well getting the allocations of money from the United Kingdom government. They cannot be spent unless this parliament approves a budget. And that puts a responsibility on Mr Sarwar and the Labour Party. Question number three. Patrick Harvey. Yesterday, the First Minister offered congratulations to the convicted felon Donald Trump on his re-election. Writing officially on behalf of the Scottish Government, he wrote that he is sure Scotland's cultural and social ties with the US will flourish during the presidency of a misogynist, a climate denier, a fraudster, a conspiracy monger, a racist a far-right politician who tried to overturn an election result both covertly and by inciting violence. Words fail me. What social and, and cultural ties does the First Minister really think will benefit from a relationship with such a man? And more importantly, what has the First Minister done so far 
to reach out to the marginalised and vulnerable people whose lives are most directly threatened by a second Trump term? First Minister. President Officer, uh, I have a duty as First Minister of Scotland to engage with other governments and to represent the people of Scotland in that process. And as part of that duty, I wrote the letter in question that Mr Harvey cites. Um, I think there are deep cultural, social and economic ties between Scotland and the United States of America. I think they're important. They're important for employment in our economy. They're important for the cultural expression of our country and for the way in which we are able to pursue those objectives. So whilst there are very clearly, because of what I said before the presidential election, uh, very big real differences in expression and in priority and in way of life between me and Donald Trump, I cannot deny the existence of links between Scotland and the United States. And regardless of the president's presidential choice in the United States, I want to maintain good relationships between Scotland and the United States. And what I would say to Mr Harvey, and I think he knows me well enough to know, that the concerns of people who feel marginalised in our society, who feel under threat, are questions and concerns that I wrestle with every single day as First Minister, because I stood here and I pledged to be the First Minister of all of Scotland, and that's entirely what I intend to do. Yeah. Patrick Harvey. Big differences of priority. This sounds like extraordinary complacency at a time of incredible danger for the world. The re-election of Trump is particularly dangerous for climate policy. This is someone who has peddled climate conspiracy theories for many years. But such threats exist in Scotland too. The First Minister's government is on the verge of making a decision on a new fossil fuel power station at Peterhead. Last week, the researchers at Carbon Tracker revealed that the emissions from this power station could be five times worse than the companies that would profit from it have admitted. The First Minister has the power to demand a new environmental impact assessment to make sure these companies come clean about the pollution their scheme would cause. Will he do so? And does he accept that until he does, ministers could be breaking the law if they sign off this reckless fossil fuel development? First Minister. President Officer, the application at Peterhead is a live application and I would be breaching, I'd be breaching the ministerial code if I was to make any detailed comments about it. There will be processes of scrutiny to be undertaken, which ministers will undertake uh, on the basis of the information and, of course, all decisions of this government uh, can be the subject to legal challenge uh, because of the constitution of this parliament. Uh, this government takes uh, incredibly seriously the obligations that we have on uh, tackling uh, climate change. Uh, the Net Zero Secretary steered through parliament on Tuesday the final stages of the climate change uh, targets bill and the government of course is considering all of the issues in relation to the tackling of climate change in the budget priorities that we take forward. And I assure Mr Harvey of our absolute determination to do so. No change of government in the United States is going to change this government's attitude about the imperative of addressing the climate emergency. Question number four, Karen Adam. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government is doing to ensure that young people are equipped with the skills to recognise online misinformation and disinformation. First Minister. Presiding Officer, keeping young people safe online is of paramount importance for the Scottish Government and prevention is key. Since 2020, we've invested over £400,000 to support young people to navigate online spaces and use screen time in a safe way and help parents and carers to ensure they have the information to guide young people and recognise risks. On the 9th of August, I wrote to social media companies X, Meta and TikTok, uh, asking them how they are combating the spread of misinformation specifically and the steps being taken to address racist and hateful speech across platforms. While regulation of the internet remains a reserved matter, we have also successfully engaged with the UK Government on its Online Safety Act to strengthen protections for young people. Karen Adam. 
I thank the First Minister for that answer. In the gallery today, we are joined by teachers and pupils of Banff Academy who have been drafting their very own parliamentary bill to tackle misinformation and disinformation. Will the First Minister join me in welcoming them and congratulating their engagement with our democracy? And will he outline how young people are being included in the decision-making process for policies that affect the online space and the digital landscape? First Minister. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome the pupils of Banff, Banff Academy to Parliament today. Uh, I look forward to seeing their bill and as tackling misinformation is an issue that is challenging societies across the world. I'm pleased that these young people recognise uh, that important principle and are taking action themselves, that they are keen to engage in our democratic processes. It's essential that we understand the impact that online harms such as misinformation has on our young people. We provide funding and work with a range of organisations, including Bernardo's and NSPCC's Childline, who support children and help us develop policies and design services that safeguard young people and provide the right support when they need it. And we will continue to engage with the United Kingdom Government and Ofcom on the implementation of the Online Safety Act to help keep children and young people safe online. Thank you. Question number five, Myrtle Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the concerns expressed by the Citizen Participation and Public Petitions Committee regarding funding to complete the duelling of the A9 between Perth and Inverness by the new target date of 2035. First Minister. So I welcome the report of the committee's inquiry and the Transport Secretary has made clear already that we will carefully consider and respond to its recommendations. The Government remains fully committed to progressing A9 duelling in line with the delivery plan announced in December 2023. We have made good early progress through the procurement of the Tay Crossing to Balnoog project, which began in May 2024, and the construction contract for the Tomatin Tamoy project, which was awarded in July 2024. Myrtle Fraser. Um, I thank the First Minister for his response, and I'm sure he wants to join with me in paying tribute to the committee members for the work done on this report and also to the petitioner, Laura Hansler, mm -hmm. for uh, assiduously pursuing this project of vital importance to people in Perthshire, in the Highlands and across Scotland. Now, as the committee noted, this project should have been completed by 2025. That broken promise means, tragically, mm -hmm. that more lives will be lost uh, every year from now on. The committee has expressed its concern that already there is an anticipated delay in progressing the Tomatin to Moy section. So how can we have confidence that the new target date of 2035 will be met? And does the First Minister agree with the committee that in order to provide appropriate parliamentary oversight, a dedicated committee should be established with the sole remit of ensuring this vital project is now completed on time? First Minister. That Oh, oh, that last issue is not a matter for me. The par Parliament decides the committees that it has. Uh, once Parliament decides that, Ministers will engage fully and substantively. The uh, Transport Secretary is already reporting on a regular basis to the Net Zero Committee. Uh, if Parliament chooses to change the committee arrangements, then the Government will respond accordingly and we will engage with all parliamentary scrutiny, as is our duty to do so. Um, I uh, pay tribute to the campaigners who have argued on this issue. Uh, I have been a, a strong supporter of A9 duelling for all of my uh, parliamentary life, and we have taken uh, made substantial progress with the duelling of the Concrete to Dalradi stretch, uh, the Lunkerty to Passive Burnham stretch, the improvements at the Balmoog Junction in my own constituency, and of course we have the next steps been taken on Moy to Tomatin. And I'm delighted that the construction work will start there soon. And I give Parliament the assurance the Government is absolutely determined to ensure that we progress on this project. Edward Mountain. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. The inquiry stated in paragraph 138 of their report that, based on the evidence from Transport Scotland and the Scottish Government, that since the promise to duel the A9 by 2025, transport projects in central and southern Scotland were prioritised. Given this fact, First Minister, will you be prepared to come up to the Highlands and meet with campaigners and those people on the ground to convince them that your word will hold true this time, whereas the government's word in the past has not? First Minister. You see, that's where I think these kind of contributions don't help 
the reasoned deliberation of policy within this Parliament. Because, as I pointed out last week, I, I came into government here in 2007, committed to A9 duelling. And this Parliament took a decision which stopped me from spending £500 million on A9 duelling because the Conservatives, the Labour Party, the Liberals and the Greens forced me, as a minister in a minority government, to spend £500 million on uh, the Edinburgh Tram project when, it could, when this government had a commitment to spend it on A9 duelling. Let's hear the, the First Minister. In the, in the subsequent period, and, and your colleagues are muttering 17 years ago, well, if we'd been able to proceed with projects at that time, we would have had £500 million at our disposal to duel the A9, which would have helped. Now, I, I'm a bit perplexed by what projects Mr Mountain doesn't want us to have taken forward. Did he not want us to take forward the Queen's Ferry Crossing? Did he not want us to take forward the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route? There's Mr Burnett sitting there. He'll be driving on the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route. So will be Liam Kerr. Do they not want these projects to be delivered in different parts of the country? This Parliament needs to have a reasoned debate about the limitations of resources and will have less posturing from the Conservatives. Question number six, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what plans the Scottish Government has to end the reported increase in families in the Central Belt living in, in temporary accommodation in light of reports that almost 2,000 children in Glasgow living in unsuitable bed and breakfast accommodation in 2024 and more than 4,600 households in Edinburgh projected to be living in temporary accommodation by 2040. First Minister. President Officer, additional investment of £42 million in affordable housing this year has been targeted to the local authorities in the Central Belt with sustained temporary accommodation pressures. This funding is to increase the supply of social and affordable homes, including properties suitable for larger families, through acquisitions and, where appropriate, to bring long-term empty social homes back into use. We are providing record funding of more than £14 billion to local authorities in this financial year to deliver a range of services, including homelessness services, and are introducing new homelessness prevention duties. We are investing over £90 million in discretionary housing payments to help families meet their housing costs and to sustain tenancies, and recently announced measures on rent controls to help protect tenants and keep people in their own homes. Mark Griffin. First Minister, a key pillar of your agenda is rightly, rightly to focus on eradicating child poverty. But how can we eradicate child poverty when 10,000 children are in temporary accommodation? There's a tenfold increase in kids living in bed and breakfast. And some are telling heartbreaking stories about how they're having to boil eggs in toilet water for, for their dinner. Now, the Finance Secretary promised that the number one priority for the government, if it received additional funding, would be to reverse the cuts to the affordable housing supply programme. Now that the incoming Labour government has delivered that additional funding, £1.5 billion this year, £3.4 billion next year, is that still your government's top priority, given that the best way of getting those 10,000 children out of poverty is giving them the home they desperately need? Always through the chair, please, Mr Griffin. First Minister. So Mr Griffin raises a number of very significant and serious issues and I would be the first to accept that the position on homelessness and temporary accommodation is not where I would want it to be at this moment. I think Mr Griffin and I can probably agree that that's a product of the financial constraints that we've had over the last 14 years from Conservative-led austerity. And I welcome, as I did last week, the investment that has been announced by the United Kingdom Government that will provide us with more scope to address the issues that Mr Griffin puts to me. So in answer to his direct question, does the improvement of the housing situation remain a priority for the government? Yes, it does. I'm happy to confirm that. And, uh, and I will be working with the Finance Secretary during the course of the budget preparation to address that very issue, because it was a matter of great regret to the government that we had to reduce funding for housing because of a, a, a very abrupt reduction in spending on financial transactions by the previous Conservative government. Now, we have more options to be available. So I give Mr Griffin the assurance that that will be uppermost in our thinking. But I do come back to the point I was making to Mr Sarwar. 
if that money is to be spent, there has to be more people voting for the budget mm -hmm. than just my colleagues. Yeah. So I invite Mr Griffin to perhaps encourage uh, some constructive discussion in the Labour Party oh, yeah. about how we might make progress on the budget so we can address the legitimate points he puts Absolutely. to me. Yep. Megan Gallagher. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, this government has had 17 years to fix the problem but the field. A quarter of households with children have spent a year or more in temporary accommodation and nearly 8,000 households in need were not offered temporary accommodation. It's time for actions, not words. The SNP have failed to turbo boost house building and now have families stuck on accommodation waiting lists. So when will the SNP finally tackle the housing emergency or will this continue to be another ball dropped by this SNP government? First Minister. My goodness, the brass neck oh, of so Conservative yeah. members yeah. in this Parliament. Yeah. So let's hear one another. For, for, for 14 of the last 17 yeah. years, this government has railed against the austerity that was inflicted yeah. upon yeah. us by Megan Gallagher's Conservative yeah. government. Yeah. With all the damage that was done, and we're all agreed that it was a disastrous period of austerity. Yeah. Now, in the, even despite all that austerity, yeah. this government has built more affordable houses yeah. Yeah. per head of population than in England and in Wales, despite the austerity yeah. of the Conservative government. We have been investing in housing. Do we have a housing emergency? Yes, we do. Have we built more houses than, per head of population than the rest of the United Kingdom? Yes, we have. Will we now be glad to see the back of the Conservatives and the impediments they put in their way? Yes, we are. Yeah. And we'll focus on delivering for the people of Scotland. Yeah. Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful, Presiding Officer, and I thank the First Minister for his response. But temporary accommodation, as he's aware, is not just a problem across the central belt. In South Scotland and East Lothian, 354 households are in temporary accommodation. 50 are with children in. So is temporary accommodation adequate housing under Article 27 of the UN Rights of the Child and our own UNCRC Incorporation Scotland Act? First Minister. Uh, uh, that, that's, that's a, a slightly more uh, definitive question than I can answer in the, the, in the parliamentary chamber today. But what I can say to Mr Whitfield is that there is good evidence of progress being made on tackling the issue of temporary accommodation by some of the action on voids, for example. So the City of Edinburgh Council has reduced the overall number of voids in their properties by 500, 500 They've reduced it down to 970. And I pay tribute mm. to the City of Edinburgh Council for what they have done. And the government wants to work constructively with local authorities to try to ensure, in the short term, we make as much progress as we can on reducing the level of voids. So we'll be happy to discuss these issues with East Lothian Council or the other, the Scottish Borders Council or the Fries and Galloway Council in Mr Whitfield's region. Because if we all use the, the resources and the flexibilities and the powers available to us, we can make an impact on these questions as the City of Edinburgh Council has demonstrated and improve the quality of life of families in our country. Yeah. Thank you. We move to general and constituency supplementaries and I call George Adam. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, does the First Minister find it concerning that the Labour UK Government announced tuition, university tuition fees would rise to £9,535 per year? Michael Mara has hinted that Labour would examine models to reintroduce some forms of charges in Scotland, and the Tory leader, Russell Finlay, has openly talked about ending tuition fees. Does the First Minister agree with me that education should always be based on the ability to learn rather than the ability to pay? Yeah. First Minister. President Officer, I agree with Mr Adam uh, about the principle that education should be based on the ability to learn and not the ability to pay. The Government, as a consequence of the policy stance that we have taken, have record numbers of Scots securing a university place in Scotland and record numbers of Scots from deprived areas securing places at university. And they don't have to fa face tens of thousands of pounds worth of debt that opposition parties seem determined to saddle them with. So that's what people get 
from the, the, the Scottish National Party government delivering for the people of Scotland, delivering that access to higher education and ensuring that people are not saddled with the debt that they're saddled with by the application of tuition fees in other parts of the United Kingdom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. McCall. Thank you, Presiding Officer. My constituent, Vicky Torker's son, Isaac, is a seven-year-old child who has a brain disorder and autism, which has left him with the development age of a one-year-old. At school, Isaac was segregated. In doing so, Isaac became distressed, left alone for so long that he banged his head off a wall to the point of injury. Horrifying that this, horrifyingly, this happened while he was being watched behind a closed door by members of staff. The door was kept closed on him when he tried to come out, and staff failed report to report this what, to his parents. This is unacceptable. So what will the Scottish Government do to ensure that all schools in Scotland have specific training and resources to make sure that what happened to Isaac never happens again? First Minister. President, I'm very concerned by the uh, details that Ros McCall puts to me. Um, the uh, whole question of support to young people with um, additional support needs in our schools is very clearly set out in guidance. And the circumstances that Ros McCall recounts to me should under no circumstances take place, given the guidance that is available to the school system. Um, I have extensive experience of these issues from my years as Education Secretary, where I engaged with Beth Morrison and also with one of my own constituents, who has done significant work in relation to raising awareness about the, um, the, the very issues that Ros McCall puts to me. And I cannot conceive of a circumstance in which any of the guidance would be justifiable in the detail that Ros McCall has put on the record today. Um, I can assure her that the Education Secretary is actively engaged on this question in relation to the formulation of further guidance. And we are, of course, engaging on some of the questions that arise uh, in this respect in the bill that's been brought forward by Daniel Johnson. Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. During this parliamentary session, members from every party have acknowledged that with Scotland having a much higher prevalence of Huntington's disease than the global average, and there is a growing need for specialist Huntington's disease services provided to NHS patients throughout Scotland, especially, I should say, in North Lanarkshire, where there is a higher prevalence still. In light of this, and as Scottish Huntington's Association approaches its 35th anniversary family gathering in Dundee on the 9th of November, can I ask the First Minister if the Scottish Government will meet with representatives of the charity to discuss what the Government can do to assist it to deliver upon both this call for increased services and the charity's mission of achieving the best possible care and support for everyone impacted by Huntington's disease in Scotland. First Minister. Sir, can I thank Fulton McGregor for raising this important issue and recognise that Huntington's disease is a devastating condition. And I absolutely agree with Mr McGregor that all those affected should be able to access the best possible care and support. Through our neurological framework, we've been working hard to improve neurological services across Scotland. And I know that my officials recently uh, previously met with the charity to better understand the needs of people with Huntington's disease. Uh, the Minister for Public Health and Women's Health would be happy to meet with the charity representatives to further discuss the provision of Huntington's care in Scotland. And uh, I would be uh, delighted to, to encourage that dialogue uh, between the Scottish Government and the Neurological uh, Conditions team to, to, to take this forward. Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Yesterday, the SQA published its review into the collapse in higher history attainment, saying that poor standard of learner performance accounts for the drop. So after essentially marking their own homework, the SQA has said there was no problem, despite teachers and pupils saying otherwise. One teacher has said of this review, it's a gut punch. It makes liars out of all the teachers who were in that room. The First Minister presided over an exams fiasco in 2020 that punished the poorest pupils, and here we have another one. So can I ask the First Minister, how many more exams fiascos is he happy to oversee before he accepts that his government's so-called reforms are nothing more than a rebrand? First Minister. On the question of higher history, the um, review was published by the Scottish Qualifications Authority. The report was independently reviewed and endorsed by the Director of Qualifications and Assessment at um, the WJEC, which is the largest awarding body in Wales. So 
Um, there, uh, there's been no example of anybody marking their own homework. It's been independently reviewed. Uh, and uh, obviously, this is a matter of distress. I understand uh, the concerns there are about um, uh, performance of young people when they don't get the qualifications that they hope to achieve. But what has been undertaken here is um, a thorough and independent review of the concerns, and they've been peer reviewed by another awarding body. Gordon MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I remind the Chamber and the co-convener of the cross-party group on Scotch Whisky. First Minister, I am deeply concerned about the impact of Labour's budget on the whisky industry, a key sector of Scotland's economy. The Scotch Whisky Association has said that the Labour Chancellor's decision to further increase duty on Scotch whisky is a hammer blow, runs counter to the Prime Minister's commitment to back Scotch producers to the hilt and increases the tax discrimination of Scotland's national drink. Does the First Minister share my and the industry's concerns about the impact of Labour's budget on the industry? First Minister. Presiding officer, the decision by the Chancellor to raise alcohol duty whilst reducing draft duty widens the disadvantage facing the spirit sector. And as Mr Macdonald correctly puts on the record, the Scotch whisky industry plays a vital role in our economy and supports tens of thousands of high value jobs, especially in our rural and island regions. Um, so I, um, I agree with the concerns expressed by Mr Macdonald. I, of course, set out last week alternative taxation proposals that the United Kingdom Government could have taken to avoid tax increases of this particular nature. Um, I was delighted to visit yesterday the Scotch whisky experience in Edinburgh uh, to hear more about the jobs the industry supports and uh, the formidable impact that the industry makes on the Scottish economy in many localities. And uh, it's a matter of concern with the changes that have been made by the UK Government. Douglas Lumsden. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I am sure the First Minister will join me in commending Scotland's greatest ever Olympian, Sir Chris Hoy, in the way that he has faced devastating news with such courage and strength. This, this week, Sir Chris has called for greater and earlier screening of prostate cancer. The UK Government have said that they will review the screening programme in England, so will the Scottish Government also conduct a review of PSA testing to try and detect more prostate cancers earlier and improve the outcomes for many men? First Minister. I am very happy to associate myself with the remarks made by uh, Douglas Lumsden. Sir Chris Hoy has demonstrated over his uh, sporting career uh, absolute courage, total courage and a dedication to what he is doing. And in facing up to what he's facing up to now, he's demonstrating courage and dedication to achieving uh, uh, all that he hopes to achieve. And I commend him unreservedly for all that he has done. And I wish him, I wish his wife well um, with, in, in her diagnosis and uh, I wish their family uh, 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 all good wishes at this uh, challenging time. Uh, uh, the, point, this, the, the policy point that Sir Chris Hoy makes about prostate screening is a very important point. Uh, we, we need to do all that we can. We must be constantly challenging whether or not the testing regime is adequate and appropriate. So the government will take forward that priority that Mr Lumsden puts to me. And it, and I'm grateful to Sir Chris Hoy for making, putting such impetus behind the requirement to do so. Yeah, yeah. Audrey Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Labour UK government decision to increase national insurance contributions could have a substantial financial impact on Scotland's public sector, potentially costing our public services hundreds of millions of pounds, and impact the third sector, costing as much as 75 million pounds. It's vital the UK government. Let's hear the member. It's vital the UK government provides clarity as a priority as to whether Scotland will receive additional funding to cover the cost of the tax rise. So, can I ask the First Minister if he can provide any update regarding the Scottish government's latest engagement with the UK government in this regard? First Minister. So, so the Finance Secretary has written to the Chancellor on this important issue because we need to have clarity for our own budgeting purposes about what compensatory effects will be allocated to, the public, uh, to public funds to deal with the increased costs that will arise for, employers, for the employer's national insurance contribution increase. 
Uh, that will apply to um, very clearly identifiable public service organisations, but there is also a question about whether it will apply to organisations that are not classified in the public sector but are providing public services, for example, um, care providers or third sector organisations or uh, further afield universities and colleges into the bargain. So there is a very significant uncertainty that faces the budget as to whether that is going to be adequately and properly covered and that will be the subject of detailed discussions between the Scottish Government and the United Kingdom Government as we proceed with the budget steps that we take forward. Yep. Foisal Chowdhury. Thank you, Presiding Officer. My constituent, Andrea, cares for her daughters who are fully full-time wheelchair users. Her home is not large enough for wheelchairs or specialised bed recommended by her daughter's physio. She has applied for adopted housing, but despite her daughter's living in pain, there are not enough suitable homes, so they are stuck on a waiting list. Will the First Minister look into my constituent's case, and does he recognise the severe shortage of social housing for disabled people means Andrea's case will be far from unique? First Minister. If Mr Chowdhury was to provide me with the details, I'll certainly have a look at it. Obviously, it is a decision for uh, local authorities in relation to the provision of the accommodation, and I can't intervene in the allocation of housing decisions that are made by local authorities. I'd be, uh, I would be acting inappropriately if I did so. There is a substantive point, there are two substantive points that I'd make about Mr Chowdhury's uh, point. The first is that we need to be working as part of our investment programme in housing to ensure that our housing stock reflects the needs of the population, so uh, house, uh, accommodation that is suitable for wheelchair use is important. And secondly, there is a, an important issue which I was discussing this morning with the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities about the provision of funding for adaptations in housing to make housing more suitable for the needs of individuals to enable them to be sustained in their own homes. And these issues will be considered as part of the budget process. And again, I look forward to engagement with the Labour Party about how we might be able to take forward some of these priorities, which will only happen if there are enough votes in Parliament to support the Government's budget. Mm -hmm. yep. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. The next item of business is a member's business debate in the name of Gillian Mackay. And there will now be a short suspension to allow those leaving the chamber and public gallery to do so.